now. So my, the title of my talk is Disentangling Verbal Aggression and Impoliteness. I think because in the uh, following two days, we are going to talk about aggression. So as a yeah. first step, it's extremely important to define what we mean by aggression. And it's not self-evident. It's been used recently, like for example, there is a journal of language aggression and conflict by John Benjamin. It's a very, very good journal. And our colleagues, they have made attempts to define aggression. The problem is that aggression and impoliteness are labels used in different disciplines, as far as I'm aware. So impoliteness, uh, you'll talk about this later, but impoliteness has been used an awful lot in pragmatics, and the colleagues who are engaged in the present project are pragmaticians, foundational pragmaticians, or you know, people who know things about pragmatics. However, aggression wasn't really underplayed in pragmatics. I have made a Google Scholar search to find out more about this, and it seems that there weren't too many studies using aggression, and for a good reason, Aggression is, is something which is uh, much more vague than impoliteness, and the two are, can be quite different. And what I'm trying to do today is again to disentangle this phenomenon, try to explain what the difference between them might be. In this sense, I'm going to start to rely on my research, it's Rosina, on morality, so this concept of morality is going to come back or to recur, because I believe that in order to understand a question, we need to talk about, about morality as well. So my first slide then, verbal aggression and impoliteness, why it is important. Well, from our perspective, so let's recall that we are working on a project dedicated to the recognition of aggression. So we want to develop, a, just for the sake of those who might not may not know too much about this project. We have received a British Council, Yuki Eri India grant, which aims to develop a software by means of which victimization or aggression can be recognized. At this stage, it's just an attempt to form a prototype system, which Ritesh knows what it is, I'm not sure exactly, but basically it's a program which just tells what is aggressive and what is not. There are quite a few ethical issues which we need to talk about because obviously if we develop something against crime prevention, we don't want to create a software which can be abused. So what we are thinking yeah. basically, what we are going to talk about in the coming days, is to create a software which works as a plus for cameras in public hotspots of crime, like buses, for example in buses in which those notorious New Delhi rape cases took place, or ATM cash machines where robbery may take place. So in order to avoid violating people's human rights, we won't, don't want to develop a software which can be applied anywhere, but rather as an important asset for cameras which are already there. Because the problem with cameras, in my view, and as an impoliteness, as a person with impo impoliteness, I often found this, that when you see a, 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 an image, a recording. It's easy to misunderstand this, especially if it's on a, of, on a, on a hidden camera, because these don't, are not very accurate recordings. You see, for example, somebody hitting the other in the back. But how do you know that it's not just slapping, a friendly nudge? It can be anything. And in order, in a sense, by developing a voice recognition system, we can pre-protect pre people's rights because it's refined the work done by cameras. And in some sense, in, in a sense, if we could develop this software and place it in hotspots like buses, people's lives could be saved. So this is the idea behind developing this. Ritesh and myself sat down in my office something like two years ago in a summer day, or on a summer day, and we talked about this. So it seems to be an extremely good uh, project. In this morning, we had a conversation with someone from, with a colleague from uh, India, or Microsoft India, so we could get some ideas how to annotate data. It, it gave us a kickstart, 
how to go ahead with the technical details. I myself not very good with technical details because I know nothing about computers apart from Commodore 64. That was the last computer I ever learned about, so um, I'm lost. However, what I can do is to tell colleagues what is aggression and what is not in my view on a theoretical level, because this is what they need. They need a framework in order to start a notation. And once they have this framework, it's going to be more straightforward to do things. As I explained today in a short conversation, I do not think that when we start working on a prototype software, we should be working towards objectivity. That's rubbish, partly because there's no such a thing as objectivity in my pragmatics point of view, but also because aggression is not an objective phenomenon. There is an, I mean, that we should distinguish observer points of view and participant points of view. From an observer point of view, it's quite straightforward what is aggression because, and this already leads us to the topic I'm going to discuss today, aggression boils your blood. You feel that something unjust is going on. You feel uneasy, upset, because aggression is immoral. Whereas, for example, you are an egg, a committer of aggression. You commit an act of aggression. You will say that it wasn't aggressive. You will start to debate. So these debates linger around aggression all the time. So in a sense, there is no possibility to reach objectivity. So we need to make it clear that we are observers and we approach aggression from this particular point of view. This is about the background of the project. It's a practical project, if you have a look at my slide, which helps preventing victimization. We aim to combine computational, well, it's not linguistics, but it's computational pragmatics. I think I should have used this word, would be more accurate, plus interaction studies with special focus on politeness and impoliteness research. And it, it is an innovative topic, otherwise we would not have received this grant from, from UK, so it's, it was quite competitive. I, I, we were quite proud of this research because the other grantees were Oxford and Cambridge, so it was quite nice to be on this list of universities being granted. Although in the long term we need to look into, look into something much broader, bigger grant, because this is just a start up. To start starting grant. Now, why impoliteness? So, um, why why should we merge computational pragmatics with impoliteness? I'm going to my next slide, Rosina. Yeah. Um, so, politeness and impoliteness are important, even before we talk about aggression, because politeness and impoliteness are broad phenomena. So a recent books with Michael Covey argue that you know, politeness is not limited to forms and speech acts, but any forms of behavior by means of which we take into account how others would like to be treated. And as Jonathan Carpenter argued in his very well-known 2011 book, impoliteness is basically the same, expect, except that it is about how we take into account how others would not like to be treated. So it's something very broad, the politeness and impoliteness spectrum. The problem is that I find it very difficult to fit aggression into the politeness and impoliteness spectrum. And I go to the next slide, Rosina. So my problem yes. is that if we are interested in this kind of crime prevention thing, politeness and impoliteness are not so much interesting, potentially, but A, because politeness is, uh, is not necessarily good and impoliteness is not necessarily bad. This is what Rosina and myself have studied in a recent article of us in Journal of Politeness Research, that sometimes committers of wrong acts, criminals even, refer to their rights to be treated as polite and argue that they have been polite. Whereas occasionally those who are nice, who prevent aggression, need to be impolite, rude. Like when the police person says, lay down immediately or you know, I will shoot you. It's high impolite, but you know, it has nothing to do with crime. It has, it's a prevention of crime. So we are not dealing with this kind of thing really. But this is just one of the problems. Another problem is that sometimes aggression or impoliteness is there in aggression, while in other cases it isn't there. And in order to show this, I would like to, you to see two films. 
I put in the first bundle dealer, there are two. Yes, yeah, the one. Yeah, if, if it opens, a strange yeah. ball is jumping up, down, up, down on the screen. Yeah. I'm just looking desperately at the refresh. Should I do anything with this? Uh, please start your system, no. Uh, help me, help me, please. Okay. My opens. Does it open, Rosina? Yes, mine. I'm watching the adverts. Yeah, but ours is still not there, but it's getting there. It's a film about the scientist. Yeah, I'm watching Christmas adverts. Okay, go, oh yeah, we still have the advert as well. Go to the. I, I will go to the middle of this film. Basically, it's an, an, an act of aggression. I'm sorry, I'm watching it. I go to 1:30, so I'm not start from. I don't start from the beginning. It's too much time. 
settling process again. Hey, hi, love, you have time, but it's how they start, right? There's no settling process, no expletive at all, and a speech act of praising the other, you're lovely, and so on and so on, you're cool. What boobs and so on, going on like this all the time. Can you analyze this in a traditional impolite as framework? No, it's aggressive, but only potentially impolite, and that's the problem here. Okay, turn this one off. And while we are waiting for the, oh, the projector is here, but let's not buy the, you, you can imagine the scenes, right? Or would you like me to still open this? You can imagine, right? Okay, then let's just continue from here. So again, my question is that if we are going to develop this software, and I apologize to those who are not immediately engaged in this thing, because, of, because what I'm trying to do is talk about practical things, but I think what I'm saying is also I important from a theoretical perspective. So if you want to, to develop such a project or talk about a question, the really big question is, and I went to the next slide, Rosina, is exactly what fund we recognize, what we can recognize, that's a, that, that, that's a real important question we need to ask ourselves. Because in some cases there is threat, there is aggression, but no, at least no visible impoliteness or no manifestation of impoliteness that people would, without exception, exception would agree that it's impoliteness. Uh, so there is a big difference between these two scenarios. And if we ask ourselves, what bind these scenarios together, I would say that the sense of threat and the disregard of the victim's feelings. Um, and this is an important thing. In impoliteness, we disregard the other's feelings. As in politeness, I just made this quotation from, from this previous book of mine. Basically, it's about feelings, so we take into account how others want to be treated. We think with the other person in mind, they want to be polite. When it's an impoliteness, we disregard this. However, what distinguishes aggression from impoliteness is the sense of threat. There is no necessarily a sense of threat in impoliteness, but in aggression there is. And due to this, some of the aggressive utterances may have nothing to do with impoliteness directly. There is this element of impoliteness, so disregarding feelings, but it's about something more. So for example, like, there is a typical example that you, it's an English one, that you stand in a, in a bus stop and somebody at midnight comes to you in a leather jacket saying, do you have fire, mate? English police may usually say that this is the moment when you punch him in the face, because otherwise he will. It's a typical aggressive utterance, which precedes a fight. And if we are due to prepare this crime prevention software, it needs to be recognized this like large spectrum of behavior. So you can't just study expletives. Exactly because those kind of crimes we are interested in, like rape, starts from this, and not necessarily from impoliteness per se. So aggression is something much, much broader than impoliteness. Uh, so there are cases which, I go to the next slide now, there are cases which are clearly impolite, expletives, threatening tone, or prosody and so on. And there is the covered, covered impolite, in which there is a sense of ambiguity, but it's an ambiguity only from the perspective of, of clear traits, clear linguistic clues by means of which we could capture this. Like there is no expletive again, but aggression is there. And we need to study both of these scenarios. Now, I go to the next slide. The interesting thing in the kind of research I think our team is doing is that they fill a knowledge gap. I just looked into Jonathan Carpeper's 2011 book, which it, he knows the following. We work in social psychology on aggression or aggressive behavior, constitutes a large literature. An interesting definition is provided by Baron and Richardson, saying that aggression is any form of behavior directed towards the goal of harming or injuring another living being who is motivated to avoid such treatment. In Tedeschi and Felsen's work on aggression, the notion of social harm is central and defined thus. Social harm 
it was damage to the social identity of target persons and lowering of their power or status. Social harm may be imposed by insults, reproaches, sarcasm, and various types of impolite behavior. So, uh, and also, you know, not contact with final notes, this is where the connection with impoliteness is the clearest. It should be acknowledged, however, that the bulk of, a, of work on aggression focuses on physical aggression and on aspects that are fairly remote from notions such as social identity. So basically what Jonathan Carpepper argues, and I definitely agree with him, is that aggression people have played a different game from impoliteness people. This is okay. I have also noted that there is an interdisciplinary gap. However, we can't accept this gap exactly because of the problem I mentioned. If you want to study threat, some want to prevent crime, you can't just say it dis dismiss aggression that it is about, you know, physical aggression whatsoever. It should be made part of the pragmatic game, and this is what we are trying to do. Uh, and I think it's safe to argue, and I'm going to the next slide now, that the key difference between aggression and impoliteness is disciplinary, but not just, not just. For example, Don Archer in his 2008 study, which hasn't been widely broadly cited, although I think she makes a, made an extremely important point, she has pointed out that aggression and impoliteness are different phenomena. So for example, she has examined the context of historical English courtrooms, and found that while the style of courtroom interrogations was definitely aggressive, prototypical impoliteness was extremely uncommon in this setting. So basically she argued that, you know, there is a courtroom in which the judge is meant to be extremely aggressive, like pushing the, the, the interrogatee to confess. But it can't be impolite because the ju it's just the judge's duty. So something can't be genuinely impolite if you fulfill your duty. And there is an important point here because that's where Rosina's and my research comes into the picture. So what is the case in the courtroom? It is the judge's duty, ethical job duty, to be aggressive, say. But if this is true, then there is a moral expectation towards the judge to behave in this way. And if there is a moral expectation to act in this and this way, then of course some, his or her behavior can't be genuinely impolite. That's the point. So morality and immorality are extremely important and largely ignored. And in order for us to take this program further, and get engaged in this research, we need to talk about morality and immorality. I would say that the basic way to recognize aggression is immorality. So something which is aggression, which is aggressive, is basically immoral. We agree that, ooh, something not nice is going on. Ritas and Atul and myself in this morning had a conversation about, you know, is there any objective way of deciding whether something is aggressive or not. Because people debate about impoliteness, and if you ask informants, say you have data, and in order to be objective for your software, you need to ask 100 people to confirm that they all agree about what is impolite and what is not. Yes, that's an issue, because impoliteness is debated. I would say that real aggression is much less ambiguous provided that people from a relatively similar background, culture background evaluate it. Although, of course, we need to experiment. This is just my theoretical argument. Unfortunately, I'm more like a theoretician, so I like to think. And I do data work, but most I try to sort of sit down and think about these things. So from a theoretical perspective, at least, aggression is not ambiguous, because we all agree that something immoral is going on. And when we talk about aggression, we also need to talk about threat. So basically, Threat is immoral, so there is no such a thing as moral threat. I will kill you. Is it moral? No. I will commit a, a, an, an act of aggression. It's highly immoral. There are covert in, um, threats, like, for example, I don't, uh, hey, hey, dude, I don't want to take this further. Nudge, nudge. A big guy in a leather jacket saying this to you. I would like, ooh, he doesn't want to take this further. 
It's a deadly threat, of course. It has nothing to do with impoliteness. It's extremely threatening. And that's because it's threatening, it's also aggressive. And because it's aggressive, it's immoral. Now, this view of morality has some implications to or on our data. A, we need to carefully choose locations where we want to record data, like, for example, ATM cash machines. Because the thing is that morality can be ambiguous. So, for example, there's a scene, scene in which two colleagues debate very intensively each other, they even start to push each other. We would still feel a bit uneasy to intervene, uh, saying that, you know, what's going on, because it's their problem. But if there is an open place, there's an open place, like a cash machine, and somebody delivers something which can be associated with a threat, then there is this moral issue. This kind of act shouldn't take place here and now, not at a cash machine, or not in a bus between two passengers. You see the problem, so it's highly contextual, and this partly built into the discussion in this morning that it's not every type of data which can be studied, but data in which aggression is really unexpected. Like I might have British kindly mentioned that I studied, studied aggression in hacking scenarios, in public events, where somebody stands up and a, co a, a comedian stands up and somebody from the audience says bad things. It has nothing to do with threat usually, because it's expected, it's just there in the heart. But you know, the same thing happens in the past, that it's very difficult. Also, there is a sense of reason, un reasonable, unreasonable interactions. So strangers, really, are not supposed to exchange certain words beyond small talk or, you know, certain types of interactions. And if such an address takes place in, in a, embedded in a situation or interaction between strangers, then of course, of course, there is the moral issue is there. Also time, what time, like midnight. We wouldn't deliver a nice and threatening address in the midnight. Gender, we are interested in, for example, males versus females, rape cases, right? It's highly important. And there are quite a few other variables we need to take into account. And this is where Ritesh Atun and the other come in. They have time, energy, and research assistant to do empirical research and lots of work in their computational team. And of course, Siri has a heavy, heavy role in it, but it has to be tested, 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 and tested again. Um, now, when I go to the next slide, uh, Ritesh mentioned that I'm interested in, in, in ritual. And, well, because I'm enthusiastic about ritual, uh, I could be condemned that I put everything under the ritual, and it's not true. Then basically, ritual is not like just going to a uh, like, for example, into a Hindu or a Christian temple and deliver a prayer. It is a kind of ritual, but I'm not talking about these rituals. Ritual, when it comes to interaction, is a form of recurrent behavior. It's a kind of little performance. Like, for example, I'm a wrongdoer. I go out on every Saturday night to beat up a few guys. There are such people. Now, if I'm such a person and I go to this guy and say, Hey, do you have fire? I do this a couple of times, it's a little performance. Even this little performance enacts the ideology of being a bad guy, and the other will most probably be afraid of my strength, because this performance is recognized, it's a ritual which they will understand, so this is very much part of the aggression game. So I would argue that there is ad hoc forms of ritual, which is straightforward to recognize, like the use of expletives. But also there is this kind of ritual thing like catcalling, which I studied this data of catcalling. It's highly ritualistic. It's a performance. We males do this for females. And it is, again, a forerunner of rape. And this is ritual. So ritual is extremely important to study. We will need to talk about it, and I'm going to talk about it in, the, in a few lectures coming next. I told this to Ritesh, but if any of you are interested, I have a book on rituals. The uh, previous one is part rape, and the new one is coming out. So ritual is extreme, can be extremely important to capture things. I go to the next slide, which is from my recent book on, on impoliteness. It's a nightmare. I love these figures. They don't make too much sense. It's just a model. Where is the role, about the role of, of morality and uh, aggression in this whole game? I try to explain 
Um, so basically, it's not just about ritual. It might be valid to some extent to ad hoc interaction as well. But in this talk of mine, just me, let me repeat. So are you still with me, by the way? Was it not too heavy? Is it OK? OK, sometimes, you know, for audience, it's these long talks of an hour can be extremely tiring. So let me know if I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much. Uh, so, and, OK, so there is a case of cat calling, for example, or any kind of ritual form of behavior which we want to study. These are the interesting stuff, because again, we will place these recognition softwares if we succeed with this project and can continue with Microsoft India or any other bigger funder. We would like to place this, this software with cameras in public places. In these places, it's very unlikely that we will meet with straightforward aggression. <coughs> Think about this. You stand at an ATM and the guy wants to take away your cards. Will he say, I hear you and just jump on you? No, it's very unlikely. There is this kind of aggression, but we are not really interested in this. What we are interested is in that you stand at the cash machine uh, and somebody comes to you, taps your shoulder, saying, hello, my friend, the typical wrongdoing ritual. You look at his direction and his friend will just take away the card. That's crime. And that's threat, potentially. Because when somebody says this to you at the cash machine, it will be immediately like this. You will get alerted, right? That's ritual and current kind of behavior we are interested in. in, in, in. So this is why it's very important to set up a model how it works and how it is related with the morality, morality thing which was in and myself study. So basically, if there is a ritual, like for example an interruption, of, like, hey, do you have fire? This guy can be use a fringing strategy, kind of pretends to be polite, right? You could try that. Like for example, excuse me, do you have fire? It's equally threatening, probably. And so there will be the reception of it. Now, um, if in this reception, reception stage, it might be that I just told you about the contextual situation, like for example, saying something in proper time and proper place. Say for example, we meet at the center of New Delhi, at Konaut Circle, at lunchtime. I go to you, but it's unlikely that a foreign person would go to you for, go to you for fire, but let's imagine this. I go to you at Connaught Circle saying that, could you give me a fire, please? You wouldn't be, sir. You wouldn't be afraid. You would, okay, here you go, and you give me fire. You lit my cigarette. So in this case, there is no moral issue involved, and it's very likely that you will influence this as genuinely polite behavior. Whereas, for example, it doesn't take place in the proper time and space, and or proper context. Like, for example, you're a female passenger traveling in a bus at midnight, and the big guy comes to you saying that, mm, you are cute. Oh dear, think about this. It's of course immoral to say this then and there, and it will, everyone will know that it's fake polite. It's, it can't be real. And this is why politeness is still on the plate, but it's, much, it's part of something much broader. Also, there are cases that there is no fringing. The guy doesn't pretend to be polite. And then, again, it's part of a moral evaluation. Just say, do you have cigarettes? Then you will see the time and space and other surrounding factors of the stress. Or if there is no stress, you will evaluate it as OK. It's not genuinely impolite. Or you will infer it as genuinely impolite if it's threatening, if it's not in the right place and time. Finally, you can think things impolitely. Like, for example, you know that this person will be really afraid of you. Say you are at midnight at the cash machines and, and somebody comes to you just nice to say, hey, would you like me to slit your throat or you will just give me the cards right now? Now, that's threatening. And of course, you will know what's going on. So there is no, you will just have this Im immediate evaluation that, oh, dear, 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 I'm being threatened. Does this make sense? not as complex as it looks like, actually. The thing is that there are little arrows between these. And by these, I want to indicate what I just told to you guys, that much depends on, the, on our observer point of view, because we want to analyze as computational experts, you and as a pragmatician, Rosin and myself, we are, in this kind of crime prevention project, we are interested in the observer's point of view. Gosh, how many slides? Okay, I just have two slides because I think I'm supposed to finish now. 
So, what's the problem? I go to number three, the model. Uh, because we need a model, right? The problem is that we have no place for evaluation. This morning, Ritesh and Kalika had a conversation about, about you know, the discursive level. I do believe that Ritesh is right. We need to study this course as a higher unit of analysis in the model, in the annotation. But even if we study this course, we can't really focus on, on evaluation, but instead we need to focus on production. In a sense, it's tricky because it might make a model predictive and we go against what discursive politeness researchers argued in the 2000s. The good news, however, is that if we focus on rituals and this kind of recurrent threat, which I think we are interested in, it's basically a productive form of behavior. Ritual is something that you can, unlike politeness and impoliteness, is something that you can study from the, the perspective of production even though you need to look into evaluation. But again, in this case, evaluation is our evaluation as researchers, unfortunately. And also, it's going to be the machine's duty to evaluate. So there's no human person involved who could evaluate. And this is why morality has to make, be made part of the machine recognition. So a machine should recognize, and this is where I'm talking about this course, where and how the answer is being produced. Because that decides whether it's moral or immoral. So we need to take this on the board and study this phenomenon of aggression rather than bothering about polite or impoliteness, which can have many evaluation. So, um, yeah, well, and this is the discussion time, so the last slide. So this is absolutely cool what we are discussing. We start with, yet we do something which I don't think that anybody else has done. So we study. We do an interaction between experts of computational pragmatics and interaction studies. And the big question for us, which we need to revisit in these three days, is how can we incorporate these elements that I discussed into the program? Because you don't need to accept everything that I'm saying. I don't want to push this down on your throats, let's put it in this way. It might be there are bits and pieces which you can use and others which you can't. So we need to talk about what you can utilize because I appreciate that when you are, you are doing something extremely important and interesting, and your methodologies might be different from, from the politeness or ritual methodology, so we need to find interfaces to integrate this framework of aggression into your possibilities. And also, what, what, what I'm interested in is that how can a system be taught to recognize difference between these scenarios for Ritesh, for him, it might have been like questions from a dummy. I always ask him, what's the system? What's the system? I no, still don't know. He has to show it to me. And he has to show it to me how it learns. It's because Ritesh told me, and I was most impressed, that these systems can be taught. It's an amazing thing to me. And I need to learn about this because I think when it comes to the teaching of a system, it's not so much interesting, you know. I mean, annotation is, sorry, annotation is interesting, but we shouldn't get engaged into this evaluation teach thing, the evaluating debate. But instead, try to teach our system to recognize, to make, be able to make recognition between moral and immoral situations, because that might be something important. And also, how can we collect sufficient data? That's a question to me, which we need to discuss, because uh, to study real stress, you can't really rely on any data. At this stage, when you prepare a prototype model, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with this. But in the long term, real threat is not shouting. At least not in the sense. No, it's not real threat, sorry. The threat we are interested in. Crime prevention. It's not shouting. It's exactly this little ritual threat which precedes rape or any other serious well, this is it. Thank you very much. And now, uh, if Rosina, would you would like to add anything, like for example about morality, or anything yeah. which I might have missed? Yeah, no, I don't think you missed anything. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for connecting with me on this Skype today. And apologies for the slight delay. I have set the alarm clock incorrectly, calculated the time difference incorrectly. I thought it was going to be seven thirty this time. Luckily, I was awake. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Sorry about that. Obviously, mathematics is not my thing. But anyway, um, I thought it was very interesting. And yes, I would like to add. You can all hear me well, yes. Yes, I think you. you, you, you I, I think everyone hears you very well. Is anybody who can't hear us, Ina? Um, yeah. 
Morant is crucial in this, but it's actually quite interesting. Obviously, you didn't get to see the um, video clip of the women walking in New York, which I did. And that's a classic example of, I don't want to give it a name, because I think that would be sort of orienting your analysis towards something. But I think it'd be important if we take the example of the woman walking in um, New York, because the taxis, the, the example of the road rage, I mean, we know there are clear regulations in terms of who should have priority. Uh, well, you're breaking up, sorry, we, we lost you at priority. You know, there's all sorts of laws. But regarding the woman walking in New York, but uh, men start saying, hello, lovely, how are you doing today? And she doesn't respond, and then, then you have a incremental effect of all what she sees, of all this aggression and, and, and that she receives them on the street, which the men obviously interpret as confidence, right? So I think it's important here to, number one, focus on what the standard cultural practices are, right? It seems to be a cultural practice that this is done uh, to women, right? Yes. Um, in many countries. Um, it might be more for one of the participants, but clearly not for the other, so although we are taking an observer's point of view, it's also, I think it's also important to see how these things are evaluated, Daniel. I think it's important to see how the participants themselves evaluate it um, Agree. the actual act. No, you're because, you have, yeah. because when you have the discrepancy in stance between the participants there, right, in the example of the lady walking along the street in New York, Mm, they're yeah, speaking yeah. all these compliments. Hello, lovely, how are you? She doesn't say anything. And then somebody says to her, you should at least say thank you, or you should at least say good morning. And she continues walking along the road, and more men kind of interrupt her and say things to her. Now, the men are seeing that. I'm not sure how they're seeing it, but some people might call that a compliment. But right? clearly, she doesn't interpret those things as a compliment. But it's an invasion of her privacy, of her persona, whatever it is. And she sees those as impolite. And we can see that by the way in which she reacts to these things. But the men don't. So it's interesting to see how the same activity, if you like, which is whatever they're doing, whether it's harassment, compliments, uh, whatever it is, is being interpreted differently by the participants and how morality comes into it. We can observe it, yes, from an observer's point of view, but the participants are taking different roles here. One is the instigator, which is the man in this particular case. But the woman is seeing this man as an instigator. And we can see that by her behavior, by the fact that there is silence, there isn't a comment, there's nothing. Yeah, I, I think this is, well, two, two remarks, because this is absolutely, I, I absolutely agree with us in a sense. Two things, I, A is that you are right, we should take on, on the uh, participant point of view. You're still here? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we should take on the participant point of view. And what uh, Rita is trying to do is to interrogate or look into participant reactions at the initial stage. So there's an initial stage. However, there's also a later stage when it, it will be the machine who is doing this. And what worries me is that a machine is something like an observer, right? So if, again, there is a theoretical aspect, of course, but we need to think in in terms of practice. So this is why yeah. I would, when we define. But this would be. The, yeah. Sorry, this would be the incremental effect. So if you wanna, if you want to computate that, you would get one reaction. You can actually see in in the clip where you couldn't but, um, see it because you had a problem with the projector or something. You could see in the video clip how the phase that. Whether this is a you know a real realistic data, we don't know. I see we put many things in YouTube, but as a woman, I can sympathise with her, right? And you know, and you can see how this increases, how this how it escalates, how her feelings escalate by her expressions. Yes, the only thing that I would slightly debate, but again, it's good good if we could could start a discussion about this is that impoliteness is important, and she does evaluate the impoliteness. But how if, or what if, we did not bother with impoliteness at this stage, because it's highly debatable, but rather would look into the threatening and related aggressive part of this behavior, because it just said they violate her rights, and exactly because of this, irrespective of how you react, 
Uh, it yeah. might be, I mean, we can always speculate, like she doesn't respond because then she needs to interact with the guy. She feels threatened. So the aggression and threat is always there, irrespective of the impoliteness outcome or evaluative debates. Yeah. But the point I think I'm trying to make is that the activity in progress, and there are various activities in progress, the activity in progress is not ratified, it's not accepted, and this is why, but one of the participants, right? Uh, what, if this is why in the case of the woman that's walking along the streets in New York, one of the guys then says, you should at least say hello. Uh, yeah. You are being, you don't even say hello. Don't you think that we're being nice to you, complimenting you? But she doesn't understand it as such. It's the, and the participants have always invoked some sort of behavior, as some examples you showed, some sort of behavior, some sort of pattern that the others should abide by. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, so the I'm not sure I'm explaining myself here. Yeah. No, no, you're absolutely correct, and I agree. So there is the impoliteness element as well. They shouldn't behave like this. I mean, uh, in the, in the, again, I, but I... No, I, they're using, no, what I'm saying is they're using that. You should at least say... <laughs> okay, oh, morning. I see. You, so you should at yeah. least say, you should at least say good morning. You should at least say whatever, mm. thank you, or something uh -huh. like that. To justify, yeah. to endorse their own activity, that is not being well perceived by the other. Absolutely. The, the question is, uh, yeah, should we, I mean, uh, what, what, what seems to me then, as, as, a, as a consequence of this argument, though, is that we need to study metapragmatics, which you and me are doing, of course. And yes. That's where, where impoliteness comes back to the picture. However, again, if we want to prevent something to happen, it's, yeah. it, you want to react on the on the utterance itself. Is that not the case? So I'm just trying to, to think in terms of the the applicability. Yeah. Yeah. Applicability. yeah but the applicability in this case, the, the particular case for the woman walking in New York, is the fact that she doesn't say anything. Okay. Good. I, I see. Okay. I see your point. Yes. Yeah. She doesn't say anything. She remains silent. And right. silence might be a okay. And then you're saying that silence might be a sign of. Um, Sorry, I'm losing my voice. It's a dispreferred response. It's a dispreferred response. She's not accepting. She's not. She's not part of what they wanted to be part. Of. Ah, okay, cool. That's is cool. Right. I mean, as, it's a as, dispreferred yeah. response. That's what it is. She's not taking it. Mm, okay. Right? Silence. Right. And it doesn't yeah. matter because it's not what the. You see, the beauty of the New York example. Yeah. It's not that uh, apart from one of them that mentions her bum that there's an explicit reference to the to the figure of the woman, to the yeah. body, to the sexual parts of her, whatever, to what we see her as a woman rather than a man, yeah. or whatever, or the sexy woman. Yeah. The rest all come up with, um, you know, good morning, how are you doing, my lovely, today, right? Yeah. Um, when all these other words, good morning, how are you doing, my lovely, could be what a bus driver says to an elderly woman getting on the bus in the morning, yeah. right? There's nothing in the language itself this is what I'm saying, so the time and place of the... There's, exactly, there's nothing that you can say, uh, the bus driver could be saying to a passenger, hello my lovely, how are you today? Because yeah, of yeah. the relationship they've got, always taking their bus journey. So there's nothing explicitly sexual in what these men are saying to her, but nonetheless this is what they're performing. And they're performing that by accessing language which at face value, right, yeah. would be non-threatening in this day, but mobilizing that in a threatening environment and, the, and we know that it is threatening right yeah. because of the way in which the woman reacts to this yeah right they trying to sell it to her as a compliment but if it were a compliment yeah. right from someone yeah. right you would say thank you or you yeah. would say oh you're too kind that's not true uh, my bum is not that nice or something like that which wouldn't happen yeah she's actually you know, the dispreferred response, her silence, is indicating to us that she's uncomfortable, that she understands this as inappropriate, as not happy, and then it escalates. And the fact that they continue talking like this and she doesn't say anything, yeah. right, means that, and we can see in the video to you, uh, expert, that her face, the facial features uh, change, something you wouldn't be able to do with the Absolutely. computational linguistics, I guess. But there is a dispreferred response, there is that silence. Right, so that's telling us that the activity is a delicate activity, that is sen there is sensitivity. This is fantastic. I mean, what you are saying is just great because 
Data Shell colleagues just had a two days workshop with this, this whole, you know, and she trained, yeah. trained them in CA. So could we then argue, because I do agree with, with what you are saying, it's fantastic, that in order to put this framework I just proposed here into practice, we need, a part, we need to kick off partly from, from this kind of time and space recognition, so where and when something takes place, but also from CA, so studying preferred versus this preferred, turn taking and things like that. I think that there are elements, I think that there are elements, I mean I've got this paper that, that you know that it will be published shortly, uh, that, that plenary that I gave in Poland, yes. on the yes. interpersonal sensitive activities, mm, right? Yes. And I think that the connection there, and there's a problem with connecting conversation analysis with all this, mm -hmm. because of course um, there is no intentionality in conversation analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a, that's a big problem because you know it's great and it's what we need to do. Don't get me wrong. No. In particular, particularly for designing a program that can recognise all this. I guess. Right. It's a thing. Yeah. But what it is is, I think in this case, is activities that are actually seen and interpreted by the others as delicate. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. As sensitive. Yes. Right. One of the notions within conversation analysis, as I say in that paper, is that a preference organization. Uh, hey, I'll stop, I'll stop here for a moment. Lisa, do we have time? Because why not we ask Rosina to deliver, say, 10 minutes, 10 minutes talk about this thing? Would, that, would you be happy with this, Rosina? Well, now. Um, either now or tomorrow. When, I mean, you, 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 you could just talk about this in 10 minutes. Yeah, sure, I can. Yeah, would it, is it okay now or would you like to do it at any other time? It's just some I so can interesting. Find now. Can, if I can find some notes, I can, I can do it now. The thing is I don't have examples. You don't have to because I haven't prepared it. No, it's, it's just fine to talk about this in a very informal yeah, sure. way. It's a now a nice audience. Okay, what yeah. it is, there's a connection between, let me see if I can find some notes in my computer that, that, that might be <laughs> useful. Yeah, just make sure as you talk to let's try to tie up things because we are supposed to give a framework for Ritash's team to be able to use something. So what I would like you to do if, if that's okay and if it's not sort of uh, imposing on you, how could we utilize this framework I just put up, which I know it's highly theoretical, but with your expertise yeah. in, in C and all these things, how we could incorporate your ideas into it and give them something which they can use. Okay, so that yeah, this is a long, this is a long of the paper you and I are working on, which would be preference organization and meta pragmatic comments. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not interrupting you, I'm just standing here, so if you could just continue, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, this would be a long, the paper you and I are writing at the moment, right, which is on preference organization and meta pragmatics. So these guys, basically, when somebody said, oh, you look lovely today, Right. Hello, darling. Hello, my lovely. How are you doing? And there is no response to it. Right. You can see that that practice, right, that the fact that she's not responding, right, when normally you would expect people to respond to a yes. compliment. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's a lovely day. And how are you today? Right. It's kind of expected. Right? Absolutely. Even between strangers, if you say good morning to somebody in a, in a different culture, right, you would expect the other person to say good morning back to you. The fact that there's an absence in the second per part, yes. that the second per part is not coming forth, is telling. Yes, yes, it's a good point. Yeah, so that's what you see in terms of preference organization. Yes. And in terms of how these things increment, become incremental, you know, because when in the YouTube example, right, when you, um, I'll try to find some details about this, um, but that's okay. because it is related to morality, it is related to politeness, but of course CA doesn't deal with anything of the sort, it only has preference, but the notion of preference, right, it is related to the notion of face. I'm just meanwhile I'm explaining this to the audience here, if that's okay, just chip in for a moment. So what I was talking about is more like the theory of aggression, right? And but Rosina is talking about this is how we can put this into practice. So what's happening on the level of language? Because that's quite important. It's already about recognition. But she's talking about is how how can we distinguish these bits of actions from other actions? And 
This is one of Rosina's absolute strengths because she has background in CA. So what can, what can we do with this stuff? Sorry, Rosina, it's just a short explanation. But basically, what, what I'm trying to say here, right, is that we, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel here, right? But, but we can recur to theoretical frameworks, right, either deductively, right, or to look at the empirically ground of work that people in CA have done. So, for example, the things are not totally incompatible, right? So, um, if you look at CA, for example, preference organization. Have you done preference organization with Liz? Yes, they say. Okay. Well, that's, that, that was... Yeah, well, that's a whole day of preference organization, they are saying. Yeah. So, that's one of the building blocks. Right, or in CA, or one of the motivational uh, features for sequence organization, right? So, preference organization is everywhere, and it's an available resource that we all have, all speakers have, and we use preference to achieve social cohesion, according to CA analysts, right? Which, in the view of polite and scholars, this would be politeness, right? But the two different paradigms that are incompatible. But you know, within CA, you would achieve social cohesion. So if I say you look nice, and we yeah. know each other, and you don't say anything, the fact that you don't say anything is a dispreferred second third heart. And it is by breaking the social cohesion that has to exist between us. The big question which occurred to me immediately, and I will give the microphone to Ritesh because it will be interesting for you, Rosina, and myself to hear or at any of you, is how can this thing be captured on the level of computers? Because it's quite interesting. This is what I'm thing. saying. This is what I'm saying. The fact that if we take preference organization from CA, and then we move on to aggression, right? But if you take preference organization, if I say, how are you? And I expect, fine, how are you? And nothing comes up. Silence is already significant. So silence is one of those things, right, that is telling us yeah. That that practice, that activity, is not well received. Uh, absolutely. No, what I'm saying though is that. So the, silence yeah. is one of them. The other thing is within preference and this preference that all these preferred responses, or second per part, that usually and has been demonstrated and the CA start with either mitigation, hesitation, mm -hmm. delay, yeah. accounts. Yes. Uh, you know, strategies which we as politeness scholars would call strategies that attempt to face, mm, and yes. <laughs> but no. they don't. So it would be interesting to have a, a set of data, like YouTube data, or you know, things in Hindi. Is it Hindi that we're doing? Hindi English. So it's not Hindi Hindi at the moment, or is it? No, we do Hindi as, as Indian English. Yes. So two, two okay. languages we are, we are working at. No, hold on. One problem which I wanted Ritesh or, or Atul to ask from you is that in this morning we had a conversation with the colleague at Microsoft India and the big problem was, as it seemed, and this is why I, I'm, I'm just speculating about how we can put this into practice, but definitely we should, is that the, the basic unit of analysis, as I understand now in computational pragmatics, is utterance. And it seems to be already on the conversational level, right? Yes. Which raises, I mean, Ritesh, I mean, microphone is with you now. Is it possible to study um, this utterance level with the program? Or is it possible to annotate it? Uh, well, yes. Uh, it's definitely possible, but it makes things really complicated now. It makes things uh, much more complex than the, uh, say, when we come to the conversation level, then it obviously becomes. Uh, but then basic idea remains the same, whatever we do at the, say, lexical level, at word level, that's, that's what we do at the conversation level also. So we extract features, so what Rosina is talking about, say you have certain kind of expressions for which there has to be a second prayer part and uh, that's, um, I mean, that's expected and if it's not there, the absence of something is also one of the features of the conversation that could be used recognition so of course it could be uh, it could definitely be done so when you have a say uh, a half a minute conversation and in that conversation this uh, this was this is something that happens 
then they could point this out as one of the features of the conversation which could be potentially aggressive. Yes, yes. So that is the, the very good answer is that it is possible, although it's a bit difficult to take this on, but maybe we should, because as Rosina is saying, and it's also built as into Kalika's presentation, is that we, there are certain things we have to study, so maybe study less data, with more preciseness, because what Rosina is saying, in order to implement the kind of stuff I was talking about in practice, we need to study organization. Is that correct, Rosina? Yeah, preference. So for example, if you if, if you use this notion of preference amongst other things, right? Yeah. You could predict the likelihood of, of an incidence of aggression taking place. Yes, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? And I never so thought about this. Predictive she's power. Right. Yeah. Predictive power. Absolutely. And again, it is this cool stuff because from reactions. So by uh, what you are saying, Rosina is ingenious actually because we start we observe reactions, but then the, obviously the system needs to make the observation on our behalf. What I was just saying. And yes. yes, we already have the deductions from empirical research and observations. It's fantastic. Yeah. Exactly. So then you give it to the police. Right. If they have this software that you produce, they'll be able to predict when this aggression will take place and go to the scene of the alleged crime. Whether it happens or not, the acts of aggression, that's a different matter, because maybe yeah. the participants calm down or something like that. But they'll be able to... I mean, what happens, for instance, right? You, there's different forms. The, the example of the lady walking in New York is perfect. What happens on a bus? The same thing. What happens on a bus? Right, there's all sorts of aggression. They say something to the lady, the buses are full, then they touch the bar. What does she say? Yeah, it's interesting because she's threatened. So she may, if she's the victim, because we need again to think about the time and place and person like that, all these things. That's so right. We're talking about victims, yeah, she won't say anything. That's right. And the sad thing, and this is why the issue of perspective is yeah. essential, that everyone else on the bus, all the men, agree with the men. So even if she does say, stop it, that's an abuse. Nobody will come to her rescue. You see, this is why I'm saying this. I love to work with Rosina. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. Nobody comes to her rescue in this culture. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because another not man will go because of the proximity of people on the bus. Right? Yeah. Other, other men will use that opportunity to touch her too. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where rape starts. Um, absolutely. Right? So, so she doesn't say anything. Right? She doesn't respond. But what you have, right? in terms of your computational linguistics, your data is you have an alleged utterance that has the format that is packaged like a compliment. But this is why we need to take ritual on the board, obviously, because... That's right, that because it is a ritual that we're doing. Absolutely, and this is where ritual meets CA, because exactly these rituals are the ones which trigger non-response. Unless That's the, right. Yeah. It's a recurrent performance of abuse for, for the woman, right? Yeah, but not for the men, because the men don't see it as abuse. They see it within the rights, and this is the issue of yeah. morality where it comes in, right? Yes. But uh, for, for the men, it's within the right, right? And there's nothing immoral in what they're doing, but not yeah. for the women. So there are different um, frames of thinking, if you like, right? But anyway, what you would have in terms of computational work is the fact that a compliment has been paid. And we know that compliments are used, literature has shown, that compliments are very often used to abuse people. But I think we need to get rid of, of the speech at CV and get into which. Oh, yes, I know, an activity yeah. using letters in the notion of. Abuse. Absolutely, and, and ritual is a typical activity type. And this is why we could sort of frame certain kind of threats, you are right. We can't yeah. capture yeah. any kind of threat. And we can't prevent yeah. everything, but instead, at least we go back to categorization in this, on this morning, we need to talk about certain threat types, which are all covered, because I do believe yeah. that no... So one strategy yeah. type is that you find in the data is that you have something that is packaged, that looks like a compliment, and then it doesn't generate a second third part. Yes, and my impression, you are right, Rosina, that there might not be an awful lot of variation. I mean, for example, there are typical questions. Do you have fire? Or well, your bum is nice? And all kinds of behaviors. A lot of awful lot of types of stress. So with British, other than others, get into empirical research, it will be quite easy to see or uh, yeah. to categorize 
these 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 cover threats. That's right. Does that make sense, research? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, even before we get into categorization, I think this is. That 